Yeah, <laughs> start, <laughs> okay. We'll open up this meeting of the Yamhill County Board of Commissioners formal and informal session for August 6th of 2020. We'll begin with our flag salute. And, oh my gosh. Um, how about all, okay, Commissioner Olson. I we'll pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Olson. The, that was part of my due diligence in the morning, just being ready for that. We'll move on to public comment and due to COVID-19 and social distancing requirements, we encourage anyone wishing to submit general public comment or comments on agenda items to do so in written format via email at bocinfo at co.yamhill.or.us or by mail at 535 Northeast 5th Street, McKinville, Oregon 97128. Any comments received prior to the meeting will be shared with the Board of Commissioners and submitted to the record. We'll move on now to works. Oh, um, and then I believe we don't have any public general public comment. So, uh, but Caroline is not yet here to give us the nod. Move on to item D, which is our work session. <clears throat> and D1 is a work session on rural broadband. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Um, so we've talked about this a lot. And I think that in, in my, uh, at this point in my perspective, I would love to see us set up some kind of program to access the coronavirus or the coronavirus relief fund um, dollars to at least get some expansion for uh, school children and for telemedicine. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, we should just have somebody else on this, this work session between just the three of us, like Kathy Tate or somebody. I've got, um, I have at least one, uh, I have an email from Kathy Tate, and I'm going to forward it to you. Oh, okay. That's a good point. Well, I'll, I'll open it up and I can well, show it to you. Just going back to what I said, yeah. I'm a little concerned, uh, and I, Ken, I know you can fill in all the costs and everything, and what you heard, what your opinion is. And I, and I think that's uh, the same email communications that Commissioner Cool is also yeah. referring to. Well, it turns out there are two projects they have are both over a million dollars, mm -hmm. which kind of surprises me. It surprised me, too. <laughs> but the thing about it is, being that we can't get, my concern is, it says everything that CRF, it says it should be all covered. It should be a allowable expense. Yeah. But when DAS or anybody else, the state will confirm that it's an eligible expense, mm -hmm. we stand the risk of we stand the risk of spending a million dollars for one of the projects and taking that risk and then having uh, uh, DAS or the Treasury come back and say, nope, that doesn't, and I don't think it'd be the feds, I think it would be DASH since everything goes through them and mm -hmm. say, oh no, that's not or that's not a common expense. And then we're sitting out there with another another million dollars that we have no way to pay for. We have no way to pay for. So Right. But that is a big concern of mine, the way the state is handling the mm -hmm. funds. And even and the state will not give you an answer. They say, well, you know, DAS will say, we can't we can't give you an answer, you know, because it's federal money and everything. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're kicking the, kicking it upstairs basically. But then they make the decision where they get funding. So Right. And and I would echo uh, Commissioner Olson's uh bringing that up. The other thing is, and I know I've brought this up before, and mm -hmm. that is that the uh, legislature is looking to increase uh, the tax on cell phone and that would be used for rural broadband but that is on top of money that's already been earmarked for rural broadband and so it's sort of like we're looking for every opportunity to use different pots of money when the pot of money e existed I don't know if it's still there. I'm assuming it's still there. And then on top of that, we're looking at raising cell phone taxes um, because we we used to, or we have at this point, paid some of the lowest cell phone taxes um, in, in the country. And, and I think that could change. I think we have to remember, and this is, I know, sort of a side issue, but we have to remember who this impacts the most. Sometimes homeless people, all they have is a cell phone. And that's, that's, that's going to impact uh, people who are lower income. Also, looking at, at this, as Commissioner Olson said, we are, um, it's sort of like we've got money 
burning a hole in our pockets and we've got to hurry up and spend it. And I see that there's wisdom in some of these projects, but I'm also concerned that number one, when it comes to rural broadband, there are an awful lot of areas in the county that have absolutely no internet coverage. Mm -hmm. And it really is very limiting. And I can tell you from personal experience, I have no internet at all. Mm -hmm. And and so that's an issue. So how we, we say, um, we're going to we've got a couple of projects that are shovel ready we're going to throw this money at it and yet do we then have a guarantee of coverage and i i'm a little concerned that we're under the gun mm -hmm. and that's the only the only caveat here yeah well may i respond to it please well, before. it has to be you know spent by first december 30th mm -hmm. i think if we could somehow get a letter and i don't think the state would do it saying okay this is our project this is what it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. We want something to write in and say it's going to be reimbursable. Because without that, even though we need it so bad, I'm not necessarily for going out and putting this out. When they tell you put a million dollars into a project and say, oh, yeah, it shouldn't be any problem. And then afterwards, they say, well, it was a problem. Now, I have a big issue with that. So they should just give us our 3.2 or $3.6 million, audit us later, do whatever they need to do later. But we spend the money, and then we'll spend it only according to what the federal guidelines are. We'll spend it, and then they can come in and audit us to make sure we spend it right. I don't have a problem with that, but the promise money that without promise, promising us money is a real concern. Right. Okay. So um, it sounds like there's a couple of different things um, that you all are talking about. Um, what I was going to propose to the group is that we uh, put out a request for proposals to internet service providers um, with the, the caveat that this has to be completed by um, December 30th and then see what internet service providers in the community can do to provide internet to, you know, um, you'll have to make a declare a potential conflict of interest, but um, maybe maybe Parrot Mountain is one where I'm somebody can say- I'm gonna stay out of that. Yeah. I would not even want to suggest that because there are other areas in the county and I don't wanna bring my own right. situation to this at all. But what I'm saying is that if an internet service provider, uh, we put out an, uh, an RFP and an internet service provider says, we can do this area for this um, amount of dollars and it can be done by, um, you know, uh, by completed with um, connections by the end of December. Um, then we have more information, right? Because we've talked a lot about the value of rural broadband, and we know that with school kids um, and with telemedicine, that there's a, a pretty urgent need for it. I think, for uh, Commissioner Sterrett's part, I think that a simple state, if we would, if let's say that area was picked as an area, mm -hmm. all she has to say is go on record saying not a, not a potential conflict, just go on record saying I live in that particular area, period. And, you know, I mean, she can even bow out of the decision. Yeah, she can bow out yeah. of the decision. We'll probably still vote for it. No offense. But I know, I wonder what internet service providers. We won't tie. Because if we're talking about having them do an RFP, I don't I think the RFP would be able to be done until at least October, probably. I mean, that's a. As it turns out, we've talked about the, the timelines that are reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> and, what do you think, Christian? I'm going to bring you into this now. In terms of how long it, it legally needs to be open, it just needs to be open long enough to reasonably give folks an opportunity to review and respond. It would depend on how much detail needed to be uh, and how much information needed to be still drafted, prepared to include in the RFP. We have RFP forms that we could plug a statement of work and the scope of work into. If that scope of work is already well defined, you could release that RFP within a week. You could leave it open for probably as short as two weeks would be reasonable, depending again on the complexity of the project. Mm -hmm. If you heard from folks during that time frame that that's not enough time for them to assess the project, to evaluate and, 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 and provide you with a uh, reasonable response, then you might want a longer period of time. Generally, it's three to four, four to five weeks after the RFP has been developed and, and is ready for release. So, you know, if we were to start next week it would probably be ready, you know, third or fourth week of August, and you could probably have it released and back by the end of September. Yeah. See, that would be doable because I think yeah. you know, what if it if it one of the things an RFP would do, and I know there's a I think they're out of Hillsboro, but they service a lot of Newburgh, mm -hmm. is cohort net. 
Okay. You know, they're a world broadband mm -hmm. provider. And I think by putting it out on an RFP like that, mm -hmm. one thing it's going to do is well, whoever the vendor, whether it's Online Northwest, whether it's Go, mm -hmm. Matt, whoever it is, whether it's uh, Comcast who has lines running that direction, mm -hmm. it's going to put them on notice that, no, you're not necessarily going to get it. You better sharpen your pencils because yeah. this is what it's going to Right, that makes sense. And along, I wanted to bring. Oh, you had something, Margaret. No, I was say. just going to say. I don't think it has to. The project does it have to be completed, or do we have to um, expend the funds? And what does it expend? And I was going to um, ask, uh, uh, <laughs> not commissioner, county administrator, uh, to clarify some of the other points, so he can maybe you can start with that. Yeah, I, to answer that question, it's it's a reimbursement for any expenditures within the. Um, within that time frame, so it's between March and December 30th. Um, so the money has to be spent and we have to seek reimbursement for the expenditures. Right. But they don't have to have completed the project. Um, I know that the Oregon Broadband Fund, the, uh, the one that you referred to, and then I know that um, Kathy Tate had, um, we had uh, written a letter of support for her application. I know that that one, it had to be completed, but the CRF funds are different, different pot of money. So. Well, and it's, it's not something I, you know, I, I will say we don't typically pay for projects and, and then seek reimbursements be, before the project's completed. Um, you know, we usually, we pay for the service, we get the service, um, we pay the vendor, yeah. And then we solicit, you know, we seek reimbursement for those funds. And then let's hear more say if our funding is coming, which I think that will be the, the amount I don't know, is that um, I don't know. We could be stuck, let's say, if they're, they bill us for everything they've done through December 30th, mm -hmm. 31st. Then they find they have more work to do until they cost another $50,000, $60,000. And that won't happen until January or February. Then we don't get, we can't get reimbursed out of the CRM funds. I would imagine that since we're, uh, we would be seeking reimbursement for, for work that, ex, you know, that's um, to uh, improve access to child, to children for, for school work um, and to improve access to telemedicine, that um, th any kind of contract that this gentleman over here writes would include that, you know, if it's, if it's a, a cost after January or December 30th that it's not, you know, it's not eligible for the, the for us covering it. You know, he knows how to put the language into it. Well, the problem is, is I don't know know any any of these projects where we haven't had an an amendment or supplemental to that contract because there's an an, an increase in cost at the end. I can't think of one in the whole time we've been doing them. Yeah. So. Um, but I, I think we, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little reticent about something like that. Yeah, I'm not too worried about a, an amendment if that amendment happens before the December mm, sure. thing, because then it would be reimbursed. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, after, after December 31st, if there's changes, we just, can't, we can't just afford those changes. Yeah. Or you won't be able to afford these changes. <laughs> And One thing. Oh, yeah. I was going to uh, ask the uh, county administrator to clarify some other things. So maybe we can go back to you. Yeah. And, and then on the CRF funding and assurances on, on reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And um, and I can, you know, Christian had communications uh, with Polk County, um, uh, who are also looking at a similar project. They reached out to, to DOS and and asking for confirmation and DOS basically referred them to go back and look at the treasury language. Yeah. Um, and, and looking at, you know, so we're gonna have to, you know, I, I do think expansion of rural broadband, if there's a direct connection to distance learning and um, telemedicine enhancing that capability um, in, in response to, to the current pandemic and with the school closures and everything else, mm -hmm. you know, on, on my read of the, the language that's been put out, this seems like as long as that project draw a direct connection to that, mm -hmm. it, it is within the reimbursable expenses. Right. Um, I would keep in mind 
that the other part is our allocation that was identified was right around 3.6 million, uh, maybe a little bit more than 3.6 million. And at this point with the first two reimbursements, we've already sought reimbursement for 1.1 uh, million of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have about two and a half million that's left and, and it's something and we still have, you know, many months ahead of us and, and kind of an unknown uh, path before us on what obstacles or hurdles that may be coming up mm -hmm. between now and December um, because it seems like, you know, the situation can fluctuate and, you know, so we do have funds. Um, it, it might be um, just a suggestion. I think one of the challenges with doing the RFP uh, could in developing the RFP could be defining what the scope of work are we just doing that an open hey right. opportunities we're looking for proposals for enhanced and where where is there the most need um, and you may know more than I do if, if there's been kind of a, an overall plan or some type of assessment that may have been done right. that identifies some of the key areas. I, I think that's some information we're kind of missing on where best to spend these funds yeah. and then uh, how many have shovel ready projects that they'll be able to get done between now and December. And whether we're looking at the other thing that I would just throw out there for discussion, are we looking at funding um, the entire project or are we looking at maybe mm -hmm. contributing the share and seeing if there, that can right. be used for further match funding for other elements of the project, you know, maybe right. they get a smaller project off the ground or contribute as part of that, so. Right, the, the difference between um, funding the whole thing or the last mile, right, right. essentially, yeah. Uh, you know, so up to this point with our, with our reimbursement requests, that we've already made, you know, because we track all of our expenditures internally uh, through the finance system. And, and so we're doing internal tracking in how we uh, record COVID related expenses. And then we do a secondary review I, when I do the request where I'm reviewing what's eligible. Mm -hmm. And then we submit for reimbursement. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, DAS coming and kind of scrutinizing what we're doing. It was only in the very first round when they rejected the small business emergency <laughs> grant reimbursement funds, uh, but they've accepted those in the second round. It was just that that first part when they yeah, were first they said, rolling this out where the, the governor's office says, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna reimburse that right. until later. Um, you know, I'm anticipating that the audits and things like that are going to happen further down the road. Um, some yeah. counties are already um, being contacted by DOS and, and seeing some auditing that's being done on expense reimbursements that they've already submitted. Um, I'm anticipating we're, we're doing, we're going to get the same thing. So uh, I feel really confident that what we've requested reimbursement for is within the Treasury guidelines. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think that a project or projects like this do fall within the categories of the treasury guidelines. I, I, I think it, you know, there's a direct connection to there. Um, as long as on the ground, we can demonstrate that if we're saying this is for distance learning, well, how many students are being served in those areas on, on this project yeah. would be kind of critical outcome information that we would have to have that should it be the state or federal um, start asking questions. Well, the outcomes you said this was going to deliver for distance learning. How many students were served? Mm -hmm. You know, it's being able to have that data. Yeah. So and yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. That, that's a couple things that are an interesting point. One is that if we do everything according to what the Treasury guidelines are, but God still makes the final decision on whether it's approved or not. You think God would be able to tell you ahead whether it's going to be approved or not? But when they say just look at the federal guidelines and follow federal guidelines, but we're not going to tell you if it's going to be accepted or not. It's like, wait a minute, you guys are making the final I, decision. Yeah. I think the caveat would be is uh, just if, if later on there was a review and they determined that you may have had an expense that you claimed reimbursement that didn't comply with the Treasury guidelines, yeah. you'd be required to pay those ones back. Yeah. The other, the other thing, you, and you just brought up that is I never really looked at it this way. If we define an area, 
And let's say we're going to find uh, Wallace Road, Hopewell, Unionville area out there. And so we're going to put a million dollars and say whatever in your project. And we say, well, it's going to affect this many households for distance learning and everything. God, that can come up that we're putting in 10000 10, or $20,000 per household for distance learning. And then you have to think $20,000 per household. I mean, I just have trouble fathom that. So we're putting in just for the infrastructure. And then whoever the carrier is, right. is going to charge them their monthly right. fees. So I, I, I never thought of that. that. That is a little, because we don't know how many households we're going to serve. We don't know how many children we're going to serve. We don't know how many people would use it for telehealth. We don't know how many people would use it for distance learning. So when you look at that, and once it's in, and COVID's all over and everything, people start, kids start going back to school, we spent whether it be 10 or 20 or what, 25,000 per household to put a rural broadband that will be used for more than after that for entertainment and everything than it would be for distant learning and, and telemedicine. But then you have to look at, you know, telemedicine is a thing of the future, whether we have COVID or not. I don't know, that's an, that's so, a, that was an interesting thing, Ken, about how much per, how much, because we don't know any of that, we don't know. And we can save the Grand Island area, the whole world, but how do we know the need is in greater north or and, west. And the part that I would say, and, and I don't know, maybe uh, Commissioner, if you were going to say it first, but I, I do believe that Online Northwest has some of that data, at least specific to the projects yeah. that they submitted for, the, they submitted the Business Oregon for grant money. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, was, that's exactly what I was going to say. I pulled up the Eola Hills yeah, project. Well, I've never seen it. Um, and um, it says that, uh, it's 12% um, uh, of the Amity School District students um, to um, an additional 226 residences. Um, so that's, so in each of hers, and I will forward this to you. Um, uh, and I apologize, I, I saw she replied in it and you probably saw this, that uh, Carrie had it and so then I didn't realize. Oh, that that doesn't actually so include many, the commissioners. How many residences was it? So it's uh, this project proposal is for two hundred and twenty six residences, um, and um, twelve percent of the Amity School District students. It sounds like it works out to one hundred and seven students. The, the one thought that I did have is if we wanted to look at some type of a more of a general type RFP mm -hmm. that would go out to, that's not necessarily a specific, you know, a lot of us are used to RFPs that we have this project and we're seeking bids to do this project. Um, and, uh, you know, it's probably not even an RF, or maybe it is an RFP, it's a proposal, it would be more of a general, I'm looking at Christian. Um, He's um, not looking at you, I just want that for the record. <laughs> um, is a, an advertising or a solicitation process that would kind of go out generally to all potential ISPs and say, yeah, you know, what projects do you have that are shovel ready, you know, or something that you have in the hopper for a specific, you know, for the rural parts of Yamhill County, and then we can then collect that information. We'll have a better idea of areas that you know ISP. Um, um, companies may be identified or working in, they may have uh, engineered plans, what they have shovel ready. It, you know, more of a general announcement yeah. to, just to see what so projects are out there. And then we can also determine, well, here's the dollar amount, here's the asset that they're looking for, here's the types of projects, here's the various companies, sure. here's the areas of the county, and then we can come up and, and identify whether or not we have sufficient funds available. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to fund some of these projects, or maybe there's a prioritization that happens that there's certain areas based on some criteria that we can come up with later down the road to just right. implement. But the, the whole catch would be as we're looking for shovel ready, who has a shovel ready project within rural parts of the county, 
but no commitment that we're going to fund the projects. We're just looking to see what's out there and what's the total demand or ask, and then we can figure out what funds. So it's just kind of like a request for information from all the providers. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then remembering that you're, at the moment anyway, you're on a timeline of December 30th. I think it's possible that timeline gets extended, but yeah. at the moment, that's what you'd be looking at. The other way we talked about doing it was to possibly set up some sort of a grant program that says the county has X amount of money to grant towards projects mm -hmm. like this. If you're interested, submit your application with your detailed information, and then we'll go through a selection process and decide who we're going to award this grant money to. But you'd need to have identified mm -hmm. how much money is available and the kind of projects you're looking for. Presumably, it's, it's essentially, you know, the most customers served, the most students impacted, the most businesses uh, impacted as possible for the least amount of expenditure. I, I, just, I like that. Yeah, I like that. There. But, but that's, that's something else that had been talked about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's time yeah, we had to, to set something like that up or if there's uh, a pot of money identified for something like that. Mm -hmm. well, we yeah, should I, I kind of like that question. Remember that um, uh, Polk County's been working on this for a year and a half. And they've really gotten some more detail, put some meat on the bones of the whole project, and we're kind of coming along at the last minute. So they have their way ahead of us in terms of, of knowing what they have. And um, they're, the ISP um, said we can't do it by the end of the year. Yeah. So they're, they're they're just not. It sounds uh, maybe you have more information. It sounds like just not going to do anything. No, they said they just they can't ISP. Yeah. Right, but also they d also didn't get a lot of response yes. from, I think they didn't get response from Online Northwest. They did from that, I is think it just the one? Alira, I, Alira, I want Alira. to say Alira, Alira, right. Alirica or something like that. Something right? like that. Or that's an arthritis drug, I don't know. <laughs> I've never but seen the name in my, like, I've never seen the word, so I yeah. just can hear it. Yeah, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But and also keeping in mind that the, the other, you know, the, especially with what we're talking about, especially with the connection for it, you know, um, for enhancing capabilities for distance learning. We have a school year that's going to be starting in yep. September it is also kind of a, um, you know, a driving, um, uh, a, a not necessarily a deadline, but that's something that's coming up to where, you know, that could be coming up. I spoke with um, uh, Jody Christensen called this morning about something separated, that different. And so we, we talked a little bit about this because there's um, a small pot of money from the state um, that's going to school districts specifically for um, um, sanitation protocols and also for internet connectivity. Um, and she and she was talking about kind of how, because it's a relatively small pot of money, it may be better rather than for aiding in the infrastructure, it might be better used to identify families who need help with their bill. Paying for, it, right. Yeah, because then it's a smaller group you know, the, the advantage of having things like fiber is that they're they're reliable, but they're also one of the least costly. But for some households, they still can't yeah. cover that bill. And so this that pot of money might be better used for that. Right. For individual school districts to identify people who need it. It's kind of like the program that Homecast has, I think. If you oh, yeah. In for education, you pay like oh, right. $8.95 a month. And, they, and they'll give you, they give you a tablet, and you pay like $8.95 a month, but you're really limited. So, I mean, you're limited to basically internet. It's not the greatest speed, mm -hmm. but in that could be, that's even here. The general, it's any place Comcast ser services, you can get a bill, you can get a program for eight ninety five for students. Mm -hmm. And that's all it covers. But, uh, so I looked at some of the, the numbers that uh, Kathy um, put together for her projects. And I think that a grant program might be a really good way to do that. So you get information from as many different yeah, as I, possible. I, and we could probably, if we would decide we wanted to take like a million of that two point, no, I would take the whole. We actually have, have a lot of other expenses. Yeah. And let's say we take a million for broadband mm -hmm. and we put it into a uh, into a fund, a grant fund. We may get and maybe one might be from for part of the what online Mac will do. Mm -hmm. You know, because maybe they wouldn't do the whole thing to have it done. We might get another from another part of the county. Now, another vendor that would do oh, yes. a certain right. area. Right, so you get a chance. So get I, a chance. That's why I kind of like the grant program. 
It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I looked at the, um, you know, it looks like the Yola Hills. And just to clarify, I also want to, um, you know, the formal process declare a potential conflict because um, Grand Island is one of the areas on the rural Dayton. But I did look at the, um, one of the challenges, and this is, goes back to your comments about the, oh, 10,000 per student. The challenge with rural broadband is that everything is far apart, mm -hmm. right? Um, unlike in the city where you, obviously you get high density. So yeah. that's that's why they haven't done things like extending fiber into the Yule Hills. Yeah, I, I, think sure. I think it's, I mean, I think the theory of getting high speed internet mm -hmm. to the rural areas, I, I think that sh should have been done start on years ago, not just in this county, but a lot of counties. Because now it's to the point where we're almost pushed to do it. But if it would have been started years ago as companies expand their system, it's like, mm -hmm. I, like I said, I think for real world, if we get your rural road for some reason to put in any kind of services or an easement we have on our rural road to put in any kind of services, the county not at least dropping an empty like four inch conduit in that channel is ludicrous. Because that way, at least if they want to run cable or mm -hmm. fiber, we. Sure. The, the pathways in place. Done. Yeah. And I just, I, I, that's something that I will try to remember to communicate uh, to uh, Mark Lago because Public Works is working on the, the engineering right now. I think they've, they'll have actually to us the um, notice of intent to award for the engineering for North Valley Road rebuilt. North Valley North Road Valley. rebuilt. Yeah, right. And so that would, might be a good opportunity. Yeah, because that'd okay. be a great, that area would be a great place to drop, yeah. drop a fiber in. Or at least put in the, at least put in the art the substructure that allows fiber to be dropped. Yeah, and I did the uh, the math, and it would, it's uh, the total cost of the two projects that uh, that I have an email for from Kathy Tate. So to give you a sense of maybe what it's looking like in the rural areas, you know, not specifically there is uh, the total cost. Uh, divided the, by the number of households is about six thousand six hundred dollars per household to get the the fiber to them. Interestingly, I know of at least one household up at the end of Baker Creek Road that doesn't have um, fiber, and I think the the, the quote was one hundred fifty thousand to extend it to them. <laughs> so. I wonder wow. if that's at one or two houses up there wow. on the end of Baker Creek that are served by Western Oregon Electrical Co-op. Oh, oh, right, because there's. And not water yeah. and light. Yeah, yeah. served by Western Oregon Western Electric mm -hmm. Like our water treatment plant here is all served by, even though it's west and south of Carlton, it's all served by uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Western Oregon Electric Co-op. Yeah. And then it looks like for the number of um, the, the cost per student, um, it looks like it's, um, it's actually about 15000 per student. And that's why it's that's why it hasn't happened. We know, it hasn't happened. We know that on school probably won't actually be now what is it, November first? If they're early as they can go back to school. But who knows? They may not be back to school any of next year at all. We don't know. So but if they go back, let's say in January, mm -hmm. if they go back to the campus in January. And all of a sudden, the business learning doesn't have the impact that the telemedicine would have. So, right. I, I think I, if it was my druthers, I would do the uh, the grant work to go the grant mm -hmm. way. Because mm -hmm. then we get to see some real and project proposals. Providers too, yeah. So. yeah, right. That's right. a good point. That's a good idea. Okay. Uh, do you have enough information, though? That's. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm i not sure how logistically that would get set up, how much time that would take, whether or not these funds, you know, qualify for that for that purpose. I think there's some questions I have. I don't know if Ken has answers to some or any of those at the moment, but that would, I think stuff that would still need to be investigated to determine whether or not it's feasible and how quickly it might be able to get pulled together. Mm -hmm. Is that something Abishaw could help us with? You know, I th I actually think I got a text from Carrie <laughs> on behalf of Abishaw. Um, 
Oh, she says the online Northwest has worked up um, numbers for a hybrid, which is part fiber, part aerial. So there's, it sounds like if there was a grant program, a grant project that and proposals like that could come together. Right. Yeah. I think it, it really depends on how general the solicitation is mm -hmm. and, and what the ultimate goal and what we're looking for. I, I think we could put something together, but still keeping in mind that this is going to have to be a shovel ready project yeah. and it's not something that I think we should plan for the funds and reimbursement for the funds. We would have to get the project completed before December. To well, make sure right. we're can we could put, we could put in the solicitation, we could put, we don't have to use the term show already. We could put with projects that will be completed, need to be completed yeah. by January 31st of this year. Yeah. And let them, and I never answered your question about Abisha because it, it seems like it would be good to have her involved. But since our focus, in theory, in order to seek reimbursement, would be telemedicine and um, uh, uh, sorry, telehealth and uh, oh, yeah. school Disability. connection, it might be less a business expansion and retention focus. But it's also going to be really beneficial to entrepreneurs, people who work from home. Well, think yeah. about it. I mean, at people who are now being required to work remotely or choose to work remotely, yeah. you can't work remotely very easily when you don't have an internet connection. I, I don't know how you do that. Yeah. So I think you can make the case that it is expansion and retention, at least for job wise. Portion, portion yes, yes. But in terms of the fo the reimbursement focus, of this part, I, I yeah. want to be careful. You're right. Um, uh -huh. I definitely think that it has a lot of value. Yeah. I'm thinking about, uh, the, the like the bakery project yeah. um, that or the the land use and how that would probably be very valuable for somebody like that. My right. other my other right. concern with this is is and I I think going the uh, grant route if it's worded right is probably the way to go. Mm -hmm. But my other concern is I'm not so sure that Ken has the staff to bring in. A, I mean to have anybody even work. On it, if you take what Carrie Martin's doing and Justin's yeah. doing and Ken himself is doing, mm -hmm. and what we need to do, like with um, with Joe with all the capital projects we have and everything, I I just don't think we have the staff right now. I think we need additional staff to bring in for whether it be internal project management or out here working with vendors or whatever on projects. Because Shane, you know, Shane right now is the only guy I'd say really good. Joe does a great job of pointing out, but Shane is the only really real true project manager we have. And we've seen Shane's results and it's made a big it made a big difference. So and I and I think uh, and thanks for um, saying that and adding that. And and I think the distinction that I would just further add is and I think that's where it's more important, like for, I'd like to have Abishaw with her current contract, really her efforts being focused on economic uh, development and under that agreement. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's some, you know, because we've, we've talked about uh, during, you know, during the project list, I think there was a couple items oh, on there yeah. that talked about doing some, maybe some further economic development related COVID response items here that we may want to have Abishaw assisting with that and then something like this this type of grant program that may be something that Carrie uh, could work on mm -hmm. and, and I could meet with, with both of them and, and, and based on the, the yeah. feedback that we have and we can see what kind of a, a program I think it depends on how intensive the grant program and, and what that's going to look like if if we're talking about having committees and, and reviews and applications and application mm -hmm. review and prioritization i don't know if we'll get that many <clears throat> requests right. for something in this particular category because i mean i would think we would just you do only have a limited number of isps yeah. with, within this yeah. area yeah. Yeah. Um, and at the risk of making it any more complicated. The one other thing we did talk about was whether or not given the short time in which this needs to be done and the reason, the reasons for it, whether or not it would qualify as an emergency exemption um, from competitive bidding. So you could simply mm -hmm. make a, an award directly to a contractor or a couple of contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, and and if, that, if that justification is there, 
then you could uh, you could you could uh, go through that process. That would take a week or two, probably at the most, if if we could work with the the providers to determine um, how how much coverage they might be able to provide, what sort of benefits that would have, and whether whether or not it met the requirements for an emergency declaration. That's another that's another option that would move things forward quickly still having to answer the question whether or not it's a project that could be completed within the time frame. Yeah. yeah. I'm hesitant to go that route or thank you for providing that, but because it, um, I think that we all would like to have more information about the projects that people have, that businesses have in mind out there, well, which we, would require we a, a solicitation. The one for solicitation. Our, online Northwest you yeah. already have. Yes. So we already have those. Yeah. That's not an issue. So we'd mm -hmm. only have to look at what anybody else Submit, but right. Um, right. As again, I I think that's something we should do. I am concerned that Kim doesn't really have this with everything else that's going on with COVID and all the stuff Carrie's doing and Abishaw is probably doing more than a lot more than the contract calls for. Yeah. But um, I yeah. would uh, definitely support going the. The grant route, mm -hmm. and I think the grant route, like Chris said, could be specific enough that that when you do grant, the work can just one requirement is the work has to be completed by December thirtieth. Mm -hmm. You know, and and if they can't, they want to bid on it. If they can, plus we're parts of the project. Make sure that it's the biggest helps. bang. School it is the big bang for the buck. Yeah. Or portions of. <laughs> portions of a big bang. Thereof. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking theory. apparently that section of North Valley actually. Um, I was on a call um, with a, an ISP, uh, I don't know, like a month and a half ago or something. And that portion of uh, North Valley that's between Ribbon Ridge and Albertson apparently has very poor internet. So there might be, like, it might be like Coho Net that just says, well, that's where I we can do have, this. I think Jasmine there is Coho Net services, yeah. but they don't, they only serve dial up mm, okay because they don't have no well they do have a not much like online mac they do have radio modems like what online mac has a lot or online northwest has yeah. a lot of so but yeah they can they can say hey here's a proportion mm -hmm. we could to service this area this many households and we can have this done by december 30th and this would be the cost right yeah do you think that you have staff time I think I have enough information to at least follow up and have a full okay. discussion with Terry yeah. and Abishaw Great. and and talk about some of the other projects or grants that we're looking at and and we can go from there. Okay. And then I can come back and report to the board on whether or not I, if it's feasible or not. That sounds great. Yeah, and a lot of this you should as say I'll only say one more time, a lot of this you should have to do yourself. You, <laughs> you need the staff to do it for you. <laughs> Duly you know it, right? Not that I'm really concerned about your health or anything. <laughs> Which is to say he is, I guess. That's what I'm hearing. He's he wants you to be healthy and well, right? Okay. Well, thanks, commissioners. Thank you. We will end this work session and move on to item E, which is our consent agenda. And we have none. Move on to item F, which is old business, and we have none. And we move on to item G, which is other business. And item G1 is consideration of approval of an agreement between Yamhill County and Capital Asset and Paving Sur Pavement Services, Inc. for pavement management software system upgrades in the amount of $25,960, effective August 7th of 2020 through November 30th of 2020. And, and so, do you know, yeah. talking to Mark, is this a piece of software that we prior never bothered upgrading or this bring us up to the new version and everything? Right, so the, I was gonna say that it actually is um, not totally uh, clear relative to what's actually happening, which is that um, the pavement management software um, resides uh, basically with the AOC roads um, program. Right. And um, they have some old data and this is to allow uh, CAPS um, the funding to assess all the roads, put them into um, the, the software, or what to put them into the system, and then to connect that to our GIS. Yeah. And that'll allow them to uh, uh, grade roads by both how, how poor they are and what it's going to cost 
and where we have the funding relative to other projects. Yeah. Well, I look, I look at this myself. I look at this as nothing more than a, how do I say it? Even though it's $25,000, mm -hmm. it's a cost savings to us. So we get good information on the existence of current roads. So hopefully some of our roads and more and more, we can get in and do chip sealing when it's done before exactly. it becomes where you can't do chip sealing. That's anymore. right. Money saver long term. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, I, uh, we, we talked about how they used to have, for a while there was a, a, an employee who was doing pavement assessments, um, but this is much more um, objective and consistent of a process. Yeah, especially when it in, ties into GIS. Yes. So, well, then yeah, uh, that'll be a great visual representation, which I hope that we can then bring to you and show you. If there's no other um, uh, comments, then I'll make a recommendation. I'll make a recommendation that we uh, approve the agreement between Yamaha County and CAPS, Capital, uh, Capital Asset and Payment Services. Mm -hmm. For payment management software system upgrade in the amount of twenty-five thousand nine hundred sixty dollars. All right, thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Records show unanimous approval of item G one, and it turns out that we save a whole lot of money by discovering that there, that AOC still had the data from yeah. seventeen years ago. It was going to cost a lot more. If they didn't have that. Well, I think the so there was a scramble, a software data scramble. Yeah, to find I think it. the things Mark's putting in place are already seen a long way to save. Thing. Just a short time he's been here, he's going to save the county. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm glad that um, surprisingly that there was that level of organization to at least be able to access that yes. data. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hurley Mark went to Brian Worley and was like, do you yeah. have? Oh, I know. We can't find this, but do you? All right, we'll move on to item G2, which is consideration of approval of amendment number one to grant application number 18 258, which also known as board order 18 394, from the Oregon Emergency Management Homeland Security Grant to reallocate funds for the renovation of the Yamhill County Emergency Operations Center. And um, Ken or Commissioner Sarah, do you have anything to add? I thought that I like the. It. Memo was very helpful. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. This is the ongoing with the emergency management's move to their new location, and that was grant funded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that's still proceeding. I confess, I was a little bit nervous about seeing um, like camera placement locations in a public document, <laughs> but that was. Well, but you know, but interestingly enough, I mean, we we didn't even know if that was actually going to be covered, and it oh, was yeah. significantly more than we thought. Mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely if you, you anyone been down in that basement, it just didn't serve the purpose, it's, especially nowadays. This is great to. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we're getting it. Yeah. Completed. Oh yeah, and, and you know, tell you the truth, where they're at is going to be a great place compared to where they're at. But I think for an OEM for a county this size. It's probably still not what they need, but it's a heck of a lot better. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll yeah. take we'll it. Just point out the space needs analysis. It was one of our only other buildings that got a good rating. The, I extension. know. Good. The, the two there That's with right. Public Works and um, OEM and Extension, is it's yeah. a great location right now. That's right. Okay. Well, I would move approval of item B2 unless there's further discussion. All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The record show unanimous approval item G2. Item G3 is consideration of approval of a three-year service agreement between Yamhill County and Siemens Indus Industry Incorporated for the programmable logic controller slash virtual machine software system in the Yamhill County Correctional Facility in the amount of $142,790 effective, and I'm gonna take out the annually, and we'll come back to that, effective August 1st, 2020, through August 31st of 2023. Because isn't it correct that this is the total, not the annual assessment? That is correct. Okay. Just That's wanna... the total, not the annual amount. I read it, obviously. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Olson, do you have anything you would like to no, add? No, I looked at that and I had that same question on the annual because I looked at this cost, <laughs> then I looked at the three year cost. Right. And when I looked at the three year cost, it's well below what you expect. Didn't add up. <laughs> you know, it's well below what you expect to see. Uh, you can figure yeah. 12 to 15 percent annually on right, the cost. Right, yeah. And uh, so this is well, well within. Yeah. And then I'm glad to bring it into the stage. I'll make a motion to approve item D3. All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Record showing unanimous approval of item G3. 
Item G4 is consideration of approval of amendment number three to agreement number 161692 between Yamhill County Public Health and the Oregon Health Authority, which is board order 19-375 to extend the agreement dates for reproductive health grant funds retroactive to June 30th of 2020 through June 30th of 2021. Commissioner. This is something that's been uh, put in place several years ago, and this is just for voluntary, uh, for, for jail inmates, voluntary reproductive health uh, services uh, before they're released. Great. So you. I would move approval of item G, <laughs> um, G4, how to go back to the other page. That sounds good, I know, right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The record show unanimous approval of item G4. Item G5 is consideration of approval of amendment number three to agreement number 154686 between Yamhill County Public Health and the Oregon Health Authority, which is board order 17-250 for environmental health services retroactive to July 1st of 2020 through June 30th of 2021. And basically, this is a reduction in funds remitted to OHA, has to do with pools, B&Bs, restaurants like that. So I would move approval of item G5. Great. Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The record show unanimous approval of item G5. Item G6 is consideration of approval of service element prior authorization number 38037897 under agreement number 157846 between Yamhill County and the Oregon Department of Human Services, also known as Board Order 19-221, for the financing of community developmental disability services, removing $11,136, retroactive to July 1st, 2019 through June 30th of 2021. And that program was expanded at the beginning of the, uh, the COVID situation, so the, the additional funding was allocated at the state level. Now they're taking a look at that, and this is just a uh, a reallocation of those funds. So I would move approval of item G6. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The record show unanimous approval of item G6. And thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Item G7 is consideration of approval of the designation of the Newber graphic as the new paper, newspaper of general circulation for publication of the 2020 property tax foreclosure list. I, and there's a good memo, but I also- Yeah, it was, a good, it was a good memo. I, uh, I try to get my hands around how you know we do this list, this general foreclosure list. But uh, being that we have to actually designate a uh, one of the new media as the new media for the general circulation, mm -hmm. I don't think uh, the graphics had it in a few years. I think it's been the news register. We alternate. Year. We alternate every year. Every yep. year. Okay. Well, then I'll make a uh, recommendation that we could uh, we approve the designation of the Newberg graphic as a Newspaper of general circulation for publication in the 2020 property tax foreclosure. All right, thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Record show unanimous approval of item G7. Item G8 is consideration of approval to reappoint Russell Mark to the Local Public Safety Coordinating Council, also known as LIPSIC, for a three year term to expire July of 2023. Yeah, if anybody's ever worked with uh, Russell yes. with, um, you know, the house and Juliet's Juliet's house and everything he does he's a very good state he's actually been pretty active in Lipsick and he has some really good feelings so I would move that we uh, reappoint Russell Mark to the to Lipsick for three year term expiring in July 2020. Great thank you Commissioner. All in favor signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed same sign? The record show unanimous approval of item G8. Um, and then uh, I never were formally requested a, a, a G9, as it were, but this is uh, this came to us from Abishah. Um, it's the list, the summary of the uh, the projects. I know, I couldn't find it. <laughs> and so uh, she uh, would like us to uh, prioritize these for the EDA funding opportunity. And this is a reminder, this is on a specifically COVID related EDA funding. Is or is not. Is, uh, is. Yeah, it's the COVID pandemic response, I think is the the, the title. I feel like I should pull up the, the correct language. But so some of these projects that you have before you are not related to COVID response. So I don't know if you want to clear those out or not. 
do you want that? Do you want us to do that now? I'm I would welcome um, it as a. Well, can do you bless you? Do you remember if it needs to happen by like Friday? It does, does it? No, I thought it was supposed to happen by the thirty first. Or did we get an extension? Well, no, we submitted there. We submitted this. this is oh, we submitted. We've just, already submitted that. Yeah, okay. The next step is, is they're asking for this to be prioritized. Mm -hmm. This is all, this is every, everything of all of us are both COVID and non COVID related. Okay. Excuse me. It was actually Carrie. Um, and for the record, I apologize that I got the two of you confused. Um, it was Carrie who sent this um, to us, uh, the request. It's um, the EDA recovery assistant grants are opening and accepting applications. And our first step towards submitting a proposal will be for the commissioners to prioritize the projects identified last week. And that will allow Abishal and Carrie a few options to discuss with the COG for competitiveness because the COG is the one who's um, doing the applications on behalf of the region. I don't see a, a deadline, but I think it's because um, it's open now. One suggestion I, I may have to yeah. kind of help facilitate this Thank you. without necessarily going through is I, I'm wondering now that we each commissioner has this list, if if you were to take the list with you and maybe rank it. Yeah. And then we could, if there's, if we find out there's a timeline, we could schedule a special session, or we could come back together yeah. next Thursday, worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And what I could do is I could collect your ranking, and then I could show, well, how many first place, where did this, you know, where did, mm -hmm. well, then we could, it would kind of help facilitate a discussion yeah. on, instead of here kind of ranking. Okay. Instead, I agree, because if there's three or four of them that are ranked, you know, one and two with everybody, those are probably the top two priorities. Mm -hmm. Right. But then we could get rid of those and just work on the others that may not be. Uh, mm -hmm. so. so do you want them, each one of them, in other words, we're going to rank all of them in terms, or do we want our top three or top five? Is that? I believe that um, the COG uh, wants to have a, the, a, a full priority list. Um, of everything that we've submitted, but okay. if if some of them don't seem like they're at all recovery assistance, um, honestly, I think that most of these are in in their own ways. Yeah. Um, you know, even the co-orchard one, it's we are doing this because ratepayers um, are not going to be able to afford this on their own, and that's a big you know that's a big deal on its own. Well, the bypass, I mean, that's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't really think it is. That's a, you make a good point. Because we have, we have companies that are starting looking at the Anvil County mm -hmm. for the COVID incident, just where they can get back in the metrics. They can't, all their deliveries, they can only make them out here at such a time. And I think it wouldn't be my highest priorities, but it would still be on my priority someplace, but it wouldn't be my highest. You're mm -hmm. looking at years. Yep. We phase, have phase two is pretty darn close to be built, pretty darn close. If if they end up show already by October, like the state says. Well, okay. with the the lens of recovery assistance, COVID recovery okay. assistance, uh, that, prioritizing why, it and then sending it to uh, county administrator. That's why I said for a COVID, yeah. for COVID uh, recovery assistance. Yes, I'll, for, I'll send it out. For COVID recovery assistance, mm -hmm. do I think it's a priority? Yeah, but would I rank it in my top five? Definitely not. Sure. Right. Okay. okay. So right. it's just, I and then, think it might be a way just to better. And again, mm -hmm. you know, we're, I'm not, you know, I'm just going to collect it like and then we will come back for whether we schedule a, a work session or back next Thursday and yeah. we'll listen, review the results and see. Yeah. Know. If it, and if yeah. it has to be um, that it's really an as soon as possible, you know, I can, and then we find out, we, I'll probably have mine we could discuss. Yeah. There. Yeah. I can have it by Friday. Yeah. Okay. And I guess it's realistically, it's not a public meeting because you're just collecting responses from three commissioners. It's an uh, interesting thought. With, with, you know, because it, it's, 
Sorry, what was the question? Um, I'm just wondering whether um, a, a tally of commissioner's priorities uh, for for this list would actually encompass a public meeting or whether... You're each going to be doing it individually. You're going to get your results back to him and then he's going to bring it back to the Right. Um, if he didn't bring it back to us. Back to it and then it'll be discussed at a session. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Not sure I'm saying, but what? Thanks, Ken. Good idea. <laughs> and, and I'll flip your spreadsheet you together. So everybody or, has a microphone. Flip your yeah. tally spreadsheet together. <laughs> and again, congratulations to Carrie. Um, Abhisha and Ken and all of you for getting um, the most projects in the, the region. <laughs> well, nice thing, not week. just for COVID recovery, but the one thing I like about this, of course, it's for the COVID recovery funds, mm -hmm. but this in itself serves as a pretty good list of future things the county may want to do. So I think the list serves more, more than one purpose. Yeah. And I've um, shared the, the list in various levels of detail with lots of different folks. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, uh, buy-in in the community. Yeah. All right, great. Well, we, we leave um, item G, which is other business, and we move on to item H, which is public hearings. Mr. Chair, can nope. we take a three-minute break? That sounds great. Commissioner, are you fine with that? I am fine. All right, we'll, we'll take, we'll adjourn for one uh, three minute break. And uh, the YouTube will probably still be rolling. Yeah. Right? Yes, it will. Okay. And mics. And, okay, thank, thank you. Good idea. Appreciate that. Yeah. It's important to have transitions anyway, and it felt yes. like weird to. That's a hard transition. This, this doesn't work, does it? Yeah, okay, so I brought three inches of information. That's just four inches. That's just half of my file. <laughs> I was oh, reading that. Oh. I was reading this one with um, just outside of the picnic table. I'm just throwing the page somewhere. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's much more tiny than my. Uh, that's just the four years I've been here. Yeah. Yeah, I put all my tiny stuff. We went through all the inputs on that. Yeah. So, like the trail and this and everything. I keep the liners on my bookcase so it's easy to look up. Perfect. But I have a lot of stuff thrown in piles, too. <laughs> It was supposed to work. You're supposed to be able to stream and broadcast, but Yeah, we met when we brought the when we brought the bread in, exactly. which didn't last long in our house. It was it was. Oh, it was fun. But we just didn't because you just heard me out. Uh, hmm? Due to lack of lack of interest.
The magic yeah. after this, we still have an executive session. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can we have an executive session? Okay, great. Then I don't have to be like, hey, we're going to have an executive session. <laughs> If it was noticed separately okay. on the joint calendar. I need to look at the joint calendar more often, I think. All right, thanks for your patience, everybody. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I, in you know, you're you're good at standing up. So, um, we'll reopen this uh, formal session of the Yamhill County Board of Commissioners at public hearings. And our first public hearing of the day is docket number C-22-19 slash SDR-35-19 LW. <laughs> An appeal of the planning director's approval of a conditional use and site design review request to operate a farm stand, a flower processing facility, and an on-site bakery as a commercial activity in conjunction with farm use. Applicants are Bram Yofi and Susan Stoller. The appellants are 1,000 Friends of Oregon and Friends of Yamhill County, which is continued from June 11th of 2020. And I have a little note here <laughs> before we get started that I had to write down because I wanted to make sure that I got Ken's uh, comments correctly. It's my understanding that the parties have reached a settlement and therefore 
I move that we send the application back to the planning director and request that he reissue the decision um, with revised conditions of approval as agreed upon by the parties. Commissioners, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> My only thought is I read the email Ken sent out on the modified additions of approval. Yeah. And I really feel good that this is one issue where we're able to land use issue. We're able to get two parties to be able to come together, mm -hmm. work out some differences. Both gave up a little, you know, and both gained a little. But uh, I'd like to congratulate both of the sides of this for the negotiations they did internally. And I would definitely recommend that Ken, I mean, Ken, that uh, we give him the authority to do that. Mm -hmm. I would just like to add, and looking at these conditions, um, I felt they were quite onerous, and I, mm -hmm. I, I really feel for the for the applicant because when you have conditions that list the types of cookies and pastries and pies that you can produce, and the kind of bread that you can bake, um, to me, I feel that it's 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 quite an imposition on somebody who wants to start a business and wants to produce something from their property and sell it. And the, and the conditions, I, I sure hope it doesn't become something where we see these types of restrictions. It's almost like strangling the life out of any effort, any entrepreneurial effort, where we've got lists of, of types of cookies that you can bake and types of bread that you can bake. And I think it just just really shows sometimes that that the spirit of these types of restrictions are really not about necessarily saying this is this is an issue that's going to impact neighbors or this is an issue that's going to impact the environment. But when you list the types of cookies and and the types of bread that somebody can make, um, I found that very disturbing in terms of a property rights perspective. So I, I'm very happy that they reached a conclusion. I'm sorry that the applicant had to uh, submit to these types of restrictions, because I think that they are, um, you're unfortunate. And I, um, I definitely understand what you're saying. I remember when I was, um, more new even than I am to land you stuff. And I would say the um, conditions of approval that a uh, planning director would have on some things. I thought, wow, that's a lot of really specific detail. It took me a while to figure out that a lot of them were related to legislation, but um, I still, I understand what you're saying. I've never in six years seen anything quite yeah, like this. So, uh, yeah. With that. And, and I say that, uh, exactly, with that, um, I, uh, I have. I believe I have a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Okay. With no further discussion, then all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Alive. We move back to the planning director. Yes. Yes. To clarify that we would be voting to uh, move the application back to the planning director um, for the reissuance of the decision with revised conditions of approval as agreed upon by the parties. And just for the oh yes, yes. Uh, just for the record, we're sure. we we are prepared with the letter already that. that Signed and, and I believe Lance is watching online to, to mail it out today uh, as long as we get it in the mail before one o'clock. Right. So it's uh, the 15 days will start today. Okay. Great. Pretty sure we voted. Is this correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Just want to make sure I got thrown off there. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sid, as a representative Thank of you. groups. I mean, you know, you could probably stick around for the next one too while you're out of here. I don't know how much, are we at capacity now? Because I know there's other people. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I at least really appreciate your patience in working through this. Yeah. You too. Thank, yeah. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank happy you. baking. Okay. Thank you. And happy wheat harvest. Happy wheat harvest. Yeah. Okay, with that, I will close the site design review hearing for docket number three, uh, number C 22 19 SDR slash 35 
I feel like we're, we're about, this is a bank holdup. <laughs> if anyone can see Ramsey, he just looks like the quintessential bank robber <laughs> from the Wild West. Maybe he's already <laughs> held up the bank and we have his attorney here. Yeah. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't have the gun, <laughs> what did he say? What did you say? Oh, no, it was the best. <laughs> you're, you're the only one with a gun. Not in here, How I'm not. How does he know that? <laughs> We're close personal friends. Believe no, it or how not. How does he know that you're the only one? <laughs> That's right. How do you know that? You never know. <laughs> Let the tape roll. All right, we will move on now to docket number or to hearing number two, which is docket number SDR 16 14 slash FT 03 14, which is a remand of the expansion of Riverbend Landfill. The original application was for a site design review for the development of 37 acres proposed for landfill expansion and ancillary facilities. The Land Use Board of Appeals remanded the county's decision approving the request with conditions as set forth in Board Order 15-115 for the express purpose of addressing issues identified in the remand related to ORS 215-296 is another way to say that one. See public notice for specific hearing parameters and the hearing will be limited to accepting written or electronic argument only. And this is continued from July 9th of 2020 at the point of staff recommendation. And with that, I will open this hearing. Um, and before we get onto staff recommendation, I noticed that there were a couple of um, documents that came to us bef uh, after the, the record closed. And so if you needed to, um, declare any ex parte contact, this would be a good opportunity to do that. Okay. I, I believe Mr. Friday said that we were clear on that one, and yeah. that is the one that I read because it, yeah, I read. There was, there was one that was yes. about um, uh, an operational uh, question, and then there was another one that was from Leonard Boydell that I cautioned him not to, not to read either. And as long as he didn't read them, it was fine. So, yeah. I did yeah. not read that. I did not read it either. Okay, that's great. I did not read either. Um, I did want to clarify that, um, uh, because I saw a couple of notes in um, the opposition testimony about this. I do want to clarify that um, I declared a potential conflict of interest at the very first, and I actually do need to do that now because it's at any action of a public official, um, specifically because this is a, an expansion um, of an operating facility onto farmland. And because I'm a farmer, and a, there's a remote possibility, and this is directed at Jeffrey Kleinman, um, that the... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, that uh, that I could benefit from the not having it expanded and the loss of farmland. So, just want to put that out there. Um, when declaring a potential conflict of interest, the public official is then allowed to continue on to deliberation and votes. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. at the uh, beginning of all the hearings, since I become a commissioner, I've, I've made the following statement. I'll make it again today, just to remind everybody that uh, when I was the mayor of McMinnville. Uh, uh, the council of McMinnville decided not to send any of their refuge to Riverbend, and it was all elected to have our, our franchise carrier Ecology mm -hmm. take it all out of uh, Yamhill County. And, uh, yeah, and I just wanted to go on sure it shouldn't have any impact on my decision on this, but I just wanted to have that put on the record again. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. I have nothing to add. <laughs> I know. I mean, you've already made some decisions, but they, again, uh, like all of us, we we are here in a fair yeah. and impartial manage, manner, ready to look at the evidence and the laws before us. Yes. I think it's, I'm not trying to speak for you, but I think that would probably be accurate to all three of us. That is accurate. Okay, great. Point the finger at that. Um, so we move on to staff recommendation. Thank you all for letting us have that little soliloquy. Sure. And then uh, before we move on to staff recommendation, though, I, I asked um, council and planning director I had some questions that were generated um, by both the opposition testimony and the testimony from waste on behalf of waste management. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to get answers to those questions. Um, so maybe you could do a, for the for the record here while you're on staff recommendation. Uh, sure. And thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, there's 120 days to make the decision after um, uh, Tommy Brooks had uh, submitted a letter requesting that, and the letter was submitted April 28th of 2020. And so the 120 days is coming up uh, in August. Um, uh, August 26th, I believe, is 
what we had decided on. So we really don't have uh, much time to uh, extend this any further. Um, and uh, uh, while there's some um, statutes that allow uh, for an extension uh, with the cooperation of the applicant, it does not appear that ORS 215.435 allows that. And uh, I don't know if that was an oversight or if that's something that the legislature purposely did, but there doesn't appear to be any, any way to extend that even with the cooperation of, of the um, applicant. So uh, that April, or excuse me, August 26 is a uh, hard and fast 120 day deadline that we need to make the decision by. Uh, so with that, um, uh, is that recommendation now? Please. Okay. Um, Thank you. This application was remanded by the Land Use Board of Appeals uh, based on two issues. Uh, number one, do individual insignificant impacts to farm practices cause significant impacts on individual farms when viewed cumulatively? And two, will the proposed landfill expansion cause significant impacts to farm practices on the McPhillips farm? As to the first issue of cumulative impacts, there are substantial findings already adopted by the board related to the farm impacts. These adopted findings will need to be more specific, uh, but the evidence is already in the record to address this item. As to the second issue, will the proposed landfill expansion cause significant impacts to hanging practices on the McPhillips farm? The Oregon Supreme Court's decision concluded that conditions of approval imposed pursuant to ORS 215.296 must prevent an impact from occurring in the first place rather than to mitigate the impact once it occurs. To address this, Riverbend conducted a detailed analysis of litter transport, looking at wind speed and direction, uh, the landfill's working phase, and the effects of fencing. The result of this analysis is a comprehensive litter control plan. And the purpose of this plan is to prevent escaping litter rather than to respond to it when it escapes. Among the uh, items in the plan, uh, it requires using wind speeds to plan for daily operations, and the operations would be suspended if wind speeds exceed 18 miles per hour. The plan limits the working phase to ensure minimal area uh, is exposed to any wind event, and it requires three layers of fencing with the primary and secondary uh, fencing layers being adjusted based on the wind direction. There are other elements of the plan, but I felt those were the uh, key ones. Mm -hmm. Based on the information in the record and the robust litter control plan, appropriate mitigation measures can be established to prevent any significant impacts. Therefore, I recommend approval of this application with an additional condition that requires Riverbend Landfill to adhere to the comprehensive litter control plan that it proposed in its Exhibit B submitted, uh, submittal dated June 8th, 2020. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Madam Director. Thank you. Should we move on to deliberation then? Sure. And commissioners. And again, I have questions. I would love to have them answered before I um, have it feel uh, comfortable making a decision, but they're really questions for, unfortunately, for the applicants. And I'm not sure how we can do that. Why don't you? I'd like to hear those. Okay. Okay. So, uh, pull out. Do we have anybody here? No, they uh, they indicated that because uh, it was written um, uh, only that they were not planning to attend. Yeah, they did not plan on attending. Yeah. So the questions will be answered how? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, that's why I was like, I have the questions, but I don't have really a, a mechanism to get them answered here right now. Hmm. Yeah, I think it would be tough to ask the questions. Yeah. They would end up just being rhetorical questions. Yeah. But what I was, uh, what uh, the thing I was hoping is that I could uh, put together a list of questions um, submitted to planning director of Friday um, and see if there was a mechanism to get them answered. But it doesn't sound like it because you know, we have to thing, have at least one more, and I'm not sure if you need to notice it then, too. You could continue it to uh, the following week, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think if, if there are answers, I would think that uh, you'd want to have the uh, opponents be able to respond to that. Right. That, that yeah, exactly. For all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you would make them in the form of statements? that concerns slash? Oh, yes. Right. In other words, yeah. these are my concerns slash 
uh, questions about issues. Yeah. I'm sorry they're not here because that is limiting, but maybe that's the best we can do. It's just for the record, you know, mm -hmm. just your concerns. But with that, you know, I can table these um, thoughts, my friends. You mean just not, thoughts. just not? Oh, I thought I can, um, you know, I can raise them as, as we go along. Yeah. If you would like, I can start. Yes, okay. thank you. That sounds good. So um, the, I'm looking at, sorry, what is this document? The July 9th um, submittal addressing cumulative impacts. Uh, from Cable Houston, thank you, from Tommy Brooks. Um, and the one thing I noticed is that um, on page five, um, it talks about, you know, as the board noted in order 16-66, uh, um, the applicant and the board have found that there are no farm impacts from the majority of potential sources. Um, and then based upon testimony in the record, um, it made me reconsider whether those were all things that were um, actually true. And um, specifically, uh, let's see, it's finding uh, number 95 um, with the DEQ odor study that was submitted to the record by, I believe, the opposition. Um, it seemed to show that there were odor impacts at the Revan Noble farm. Um, and and I don't I didn't see, I mean, I people Houston didn't address that. So I wanted to, to get their sense of how how it was that there was found to be significant odors by DEQ. Um, and this is just the thing that was in the record. I forget who the submittal was from. Um, and then the um, it's not the, I guess it's it's really the uh, finding number 43 would, it's hard to see that it's, there's not a, an impact. And it's not, it's not air particulates, but it is emissions from the landfill that we've seen in the notice of violation that the EPA um, sent to Riverbend. Um, and that's, so it's air particulate, I would say is not a volatile organic compound and it's not um, the methane that's coming out that was the subject of the NOV. But um, I would love to see, hear from them what they think of the, the methane emissions in the context of not having any kind of air uh, impact to air quality. Uh, number, finding number 40, um, I would love to find out what they think about um, how water quality is or not, not is or is not impacted by the leachate spills that were also included in the record. I think it was, there was at least a, a back and forth from one of the opponents and DEQ, specifically around leachates, because there was a leachate spill after a flood, maybe not a flood, a big rain event or an ice event or something like that. And that seems like that's an impact to water quality, but they didn't, they did not address it. They just said, well, there's not any. <clears throat> Um, with respect to also page six, um, there's a, a conversation about nuisance birds. Um, the board concluded, it says the board concluded in finding number 69, there's no evidence in the record that contamination actually occurs in filbert orchards as a result of goals or any other bird species. Um, but I'm, essentially that seems to uh, pass over the fact that Jennifer Redmond Noble submitted testimony that said that birds were impacting her sheep. Um, and that the, if we think about, because this is all about um, impacts that are not themselves significant, but that the additive is, if, if the combined is significant um, by adding to insignificant impacts. Um, and I'm just thinking that if she has a situation where she is experiencing, experiencing as a neutral word, suffering odor issues um, that impact her ability to have a farm stand, um, and then she has birds, that seems like an additive thing. That seems like two things that maybe the board in the past decided were insignificant, but that together could be considered significant and it isn't addressed in this. 
the next question um, I had that's on that similar page is that um, for some reason they seem to not think that um, maybe it's just that it's hard to talk about math when you're talking about impacts, but they're using the word additive, which I think about as an addition, right? Uh, you, you add two things together. And I think that they're trying to argue, um, Councillor Brooks is trying to argue that um, because they're different units, you can't add them essentially. Um, that there's some kind of math there that's not um, that's not workable, workable. And that's specifically with the McPhillips farm, it's around um, that litter and bird impacts, you can't add them together because they're somehow not related or they're not related. But my, my curiosity around that is that they're both farm impacts and they both, even if they're insignificant or if one is significant and the other is insignificant, that presumably you can add them when you take it down to the base level of cost, right? That maybe, maybe one is about planting and the other one's about harvesting, but both of those things have costs. Um, so I, I just wanted to hear from them about that. Um, I also wanted to uh, find out, my, there's a question at the bottom of page six, and that's around the robust management of nuisance birds. And I'd like to know uh, from them, uh, does the falconry program work? And then I'd love to have them define what work means. Because <laughs> I know that the falconry program is designed to scatter birds from the site, um, but I'd love to see some data about, do we, are they seeing um, fewer nuisance birds across the area because of the falconry program, or is it just they're seeing fewer birds at the landfill? So that was the question I had there. Um, I think if we move on, and I'll be free, I'm trying to be brief, I swear. Thanks for being patient with me. Um, I think if I move on to the submittal, the second submittal from July 8th, which is specifically about, um, I think this, is there, this addresses uh, the Ramsey McPhillips property. Um, sorry, let me find. Oh yeah, so um, one question I had is, um, we still don't seem to have any information upon about the green technology. Um, and I'd like to have more information about that as part of um, the, the, the decision. And I realized that that's kind of outside the bounds of the need to define whether there's a significant impact to Mr. McPhillips's haying operation. But since they brought it up, I think I can ask about it and I would love to find out more about it. But along those lines, um, I've, I've got a question that actually I think planning director uh, Friday will be able to answer. Because what I see in here is that they're saying that this expansion would provide for another 12 years at 300,000 tons. But can you remind me of what they're hauling right now? Uh, I think it was 60. Okay, that's what I thought too. But And so I, what I realized is that if you, you know, if you do the addition as it were, that actually, if they maintain their current rates, this is a 60 year life, right? Because it's 300,000 divided by 60,000 is five multiplied by 12. Um, and so that, that seemed like a, something that I would like to know from them is, are, are we talking about a 60 year life? Or why, why have we, what has happened that has caused the reduction in hauling um, to the landfill and why do you expect that it'll go up to 300,000 or do you expect it to go up to 300,000? So those are some questions that I feel like I need in order to have a more complete answer or decision, excuse me. Um, I wrote a question about, did you consider escaping litter from vehicles? And that's on page seven of the initial remand submittal um, at the top, because it talks about that. The thing that, um, I see in technical memorandum exhibit A, the like really big one, um, is that at some point there was a litter density analysis. Uh, and it says that the litter density analysis uh, revealed that litter densities near the landfill uh, were lower than on highways elsewhere in the county. And I, I would love to hear more from them about that. Um, and mostly that's because that's not my experience. <laughs> of the different roads and highways in the county. 
Um, and so I just want to hear from them about that. Uh, further down on page seven of the initial remand submittal, the question I have uh, is that it says, Riverbend's field observations also reveal that even when the wind is blowing at higher, at higher speeds, litter to, little to no litter travels beyond the landfill's working face. And then it says, as you go further down, the stark result was that even in higher wind conditions, meaningful amounts of litter do not move away from the site. And I'd love to hear from them about what they mean by uh, little to no versus uh, no meaningful. I mean, are we talking that uh, one part per million is escaping of the litter or, um, cause that would be little to no, but meaningful to me suggests things like only 5% of the litter is escaping. I am at the end of the same page. I wanted to hear uh, from them because it says, based upon this information, Riverbend will place mobile uh, litter fencing on the downwind side of the working face. And um, it talks about the, the litter control, what is it, the comprehensive litter control program. And to me, it seems like it's something that it's going to be challenging. Uh, Diligent uh, maintenance of this particular plan will require generational levels of, uh, of training and plans and checklists and um, you know, wind alarms, especially if we're looking at 60 years rather than just 12 years. And so I wanted, in light of the notice of violation from EPA, I read that very carefully, uh, it seemed like uh, it's it's strange credulity to think that they can um, say we're oh we're we're doing this doing this accurately and diligently and we will do this accurately and diligently but when they're not clearly doing one of those accurately and diligently I have a hard time believing that the other one will be fulfilled too and really I would love to hear from them about that because um, I. I want to believe that this system that they are proposing with the stopping operations before, you know, when the re wind reaches certain levels, that this is going to be something that they're going to be able to continue for 60 years or for 12 years. <clears throat> um, so uh, my next question, if we go into page eight, um, is that a key component of the CLCP is that Riverbend will actually suspend operations if wind exceeds wind speeds exceed 18 miles per hour. And um, what I wanted to know with that then is uh, where the where is the garbage coming from right now that's ending up in the fields of Brigham Z. McPhillips and other people around the area? Because uh, that's a key question for me is if, if they feel like they're doing a really good job of it, but there's still garbage, then it would be really good to know where that material is coming from. The... Blue Ridge, whatever, the, the Blue Ridge folks who are employed by CSA to do the analysis, they're, they're like super, super fine print seem to suggest that a lot of, you know, as you get closer to 18 miles per hour, a lot of litter gets moved. That's what, I mean, that's what it says. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit, I think like they've got this line that they're like 18 miles an hour and it feels kind of like the cookies. <laughs> you know, like here are the things that we're gonna do. We're gonna make this type of cookie, but we're not gonna make this type of cookie. And it's not a condition of approval, but we, will, we would be approving essentially the plan that they have generated. Um, and if, if garbage is moving at 18 or at 15 or it's 12 or something like that uh, in that table, that's really hard to read. See, so it's page four, I think, the gentle breeze. Um, and then page five, which is the fresh breeze. And I must say that a modified Beaufort scale that talks about gentle breezes and fresh breezes was really nice. Felt it made me happy. But it's concerning to me because the technical memorandum seems to suggest that a lot more garbage litter moves than um, the, uh, the plan is set up for. All right, that might be everything for right now. Let me see. 
Um, so they close by seeing, saying, you know, we're going to do a really good job of this. And so this is, again, I, these are questions I'd love to hear from them, um, the answers to. It says, even so, should a few pieces of litter occasionally make it to those areas, the board can conclude that they do not significantly impact hanging practices, as the amount of time it takes to pick up a few pieces of litter is insignificant. And I was thinking about uh, uh, Clark uh, Ellingson's uh, testimony that's in the record, where uh, he, you know he talked about, it, and the, again, it's not totally comparable because he, he, I don't think he knew that there was litter in there when he bailed the field that was near the landfill. But I wanted to hear from uh, Riverbend their take on everything that would have to go into removing a few pieces of litter from, I don't remember how big that field is, but it's a fairly, fairly big field. So I think that concludes the questions that I had for the applicant. So I have a suggestion. I'm wondering if Mr. Yeah. Sadlow would feel comfortable addressing any of those. I know we've all, you've worked on this for years. Uh, we've been at multiple, multiple hearings regarding some of these issues when a lot of a lot of the testimony that's been um, uh, that's referred to here has actually been made orally. Is that something that would be appropriate, or you'd be comfortable addressing some of the questions that uh, uh, Chair Kula has, or is this something we should just consider as as comments and statements to be entered into the record? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Starrett, uh, I, I am thinking of it more in terms of the record is closed. And so this would be not the time to ask uh, Riverbend a mm -hmm. lot of questions. And uh, so I'm treating it as more of your, this is your deliberation and this is the way mm -hmm. that you're musing about the, yeah. the uh, uh, information that's in the record and what you may believe is lacking. Uh, so I just wanted to make it clear and make it clear for the applicant that we we told him you're yeah. not going to be able to speak at this hearing and that's why they're not here. Exactly. So, yeah. No, that's that's and I and as, we as we, you we simply you don't have time uh, given August 26th deadline, you would need to have the findings done by August 20th, mm -hmm. which is your next the the two weeks from today. Right. And so there's really no way to to have a period to allow the applicant to answer the questions that you've raised and to, to allow rebuttal of that. Right. Uh, we'd really just be starting up another cycle right. for this okay. thing. So thank uh, you for clarifying that. Yeah. I, I, I just did not want to leave it to where it looked like unanswered. the applicant yeah. didn't come, looked like they were dismissive of any further questions, but thank you for reminding us that it is not appropriate for there to be any more testimony, and right. that would include rebuttal or responding to those questions. And I very much appreciate you raising that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's very good to clarify. We don't wanna make it look like, hey, I'm asking these questions, but we're not letting them come. Right, Yeah. correct. Yeah, but really that to that end, I mean, as I was reading, okay. I was like, I know that these, this isn't, I'm not gonna be able to get an answer to these questions, but these are the questions that I've generated. And they really around like, is 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 a meaningful amount of garbage? What does that look like? Okay. You know, um, is it is it feasible to do this for sixty years if that's the case? But commissioners, I would invite your thoughts as well. Now, thank you for letting me go. Uh, having been through several of these in the past six years, I've heard a lot of the testimony and and read read a lot of these um, a lot of these over the years. I just would like to uh, add a, a couple of things. Is that as as um, it's been it's been brought out by Mr. Brooks, really what we're looking at here is the the expansion question, and and does that have significant impacts to um, to hang practices at at Mr. McPhillips' farm? And we've already addressed issues like water quality and floodplain, and and the board has has at the past boards have uh, addressed these issues. So really what we're looking at now is just the expansion, the whole expansion and, and, and looking at, at what this means and whether or not this complies with site design review. And it appears 
that 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 has been lost in some of the greater questions that people have about the landfill and have for years. And you can definitely argue a, a lot of these points. But I think when you look at uh, what we're here to do today, we're not here to say, should the landfill have been cited there? I don't think anybody would have said yes. Were there Are there not impacts? Have there not been impacts? I don't think anyone would disagree with that. What, what I see my role here is to say, is this expansion going to cause significant impacts um, as we as we talked about? But does this meet the site design review and floodplain development um, criteria? Mm -hmm. I think it does. I would never have been on a board that approved a siting of it, but I do believe that the expansion is not out of line, especially the way waste management has in the past mitigated a lot of these these issues. So that is pretty much how I look at what we're here to do today. Yeah, thank you for providing that scope. Thank you. You know, I'll, I'll go keep going along those lines that Commissioner Sterrett went along is that, uh, you know, our scope of our hearing has been laid out as two different things. Is whether evidence in the record demonstrates the presence of presence or absent absence of significant cumulative impacts to accepted farm practice, including the cost of these practice from the existing landfill and the proposed expansion area. And then the second thing is whether litter generated by the existing landfill or expected to be generated by the proposed expansion landfill will force a significant change in accepted farm practices, including the cost of practice on the McPhillips Hay Farm located east of the landfill at 13351 McPhillips. Phillips Road and Kendall. And as I look at those, you know, we know there's been impacts, whether they're insignificant. And I think uh, even in a letter from Cable of Houston, July, stated July 9th, they say cumulative impact, and this is on page one of their introduction and background, they say cumulative impacts on farm practices. Uh, it is a, in the review of Law 66, Luke expressing only that. From the committee's conclusion that individual impacts as condition are insignificant, but said the county's findings must go into more de detail before the county can determine the individual insignificant impacts, some of which may be additive and some which may not be are humanly significant in respect to each farm that alleged multiple impacts of their. Um, for our practices, and I think that gets back to Casey, what you're talking about, like the, the old tree farm. Mm -hmm. um, and then on page two, on the mm -hmm. item number 137 of the July 19th, 2020 memo, they say about uh, six, halfway down through the, uh, or maybe third, six or seven lines down, they say for some, for some of these potential sources like water quality, air particulates, traffic and visual impacts, the record is very clear that no farm impacts result from the operation of the land. And then they say for others like litter, nuisance birds, robots, odor, noise, and the record demonstrate that the actual impact of each is not significant or that it's certain that there will be no minimal impact through. And then the last paragraph goes into um, the record also demonstrates that the applicant controls its operations to manage the potential sources of impact and the board is imposing conditions approved to increase those levels of impact. Well, as I look at this, I'm hanging on the same thing Commissioner Sterrett said on the expansion. And unfortunately, it's been leaked and it, you know, we can't stop season it there, but, but the violations, the EPA violations that came out and then we got a letter from waste management saying that, oh, that was supposed to be confidential. That should have gone out. You guys never should have known about it. About a landfill in our own county that has had EPA violations and we're not supposed to know about it. We're not supposed to do anything. That really bothered me. But based on that, I do believe that the proposed expansion, that there are more significant impacts in the existing landfill, but more importantly, uh, from the existing app, the proposed expansion area, I am very concerned that we will see an increase in those impacts in the proposed expansion area. 
and we will see impacts on farms that may not have impacts now. Uh, as an example, when I read about the um, you know the site design and review and putting a uh, berm in the floodland, you know where we're going to put. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens if that berm? What happens if we have flood that berm fails? What happens if the landfill fails? I think the significant environmental impacts that every farmer from the landfill, which we're not taking into consideration, every farmer from the landfill down to the Willamette Valley is going to suffer. Because where do they draw their irrigation water? Uh, mostly out of the Anhill, the Anhill River. I, and I believe with the escaping methane gas, they're not controlling the escaping methane gas. I think there's much more gas being escaped than they uh, lead to believe. So in all honesty, if it was just a continuance of the existing landfill, I don't like it, but I can live it with it. But I just personally can't live for several reasons. I can't live uh, with the uh, item number one of our scope of hearing, whether evidence in the record demonstrates the presence or absence of significant cumulative impacts to accepted farm practices, including the cost of those practices from the existing landfill and I can and the proposed expansion. We don't know what those will be in the proposed expansion to say that they will be insignificant. They could be much higher, highly significant, and on many more farms than, than we believe. And then when they talk about it's all on site of the expansion, they as they tap the cells and everything, the only thing that will change is where the new cells are. Mm -hmm. That means they're changing the location on that on that piece of property. Well, by changing the location, what farms around that, okay, maybe on the on the mm -hmm. south of the mm -hmm. river or whatever, are going to see an impact. Um, so I just guess I I, I just can support I just support this, uh, and then and I say that under one of our criteria, which is whether we feel it's happening with the existing landfill and the proposed expansion landfill. I just can't support the proposed expansion of the landfill. Yeah. Several of those reasons. Thank you, Commissioner. I wanted to address because I didn't really address how I'd seen the evidence in the record around the haying operation, um, and I I must confess that you know you're not supposed to have a view coming into these things, but I I did you know I see along all of our roadsides I see people cutting um, hay and swapping grass seed and baling grass seed um, in addition to hay fields, and so I see garbage that gets blown into people's fields. And I thought, oh well, they're they're clearly fine with it. Like this, this must, this maybe is not that big of an impact. Um, and I want to note that I did read um, uh, the the comments in support of the landfill from the farmer who's adjacent or who farms around the area. Mr. Uh, Bacon. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, sometimes I feel funny about saying people's names in the record when they're not in the room, but thank you. Um, but then I. I read the statements of farmers from the area who are in, in opposition to them, um, to uh, who claim a significant impact from uh, garbage in the in the haying and in the grass seed swapping and baling, um, and they were. I, I I wanted to think that this wasn't significant. That this wasn't a big deal. Um, and then I heard from them and I realized um, I, I do need to actually listen to these people who are um, farmers in the community who are experiencing, both they've had experience with garbage um, uh, in their hay and the experience of trying to sell um, hay. Um, one of the, the things that was particularly noteworthy, I think, to me was um, when uh, Mr. Sweeney um, talked about the value of the, 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 the county and the state's um, hay and grass seed um, straw in the global market. And just the value of that perception, at the very least, um, it, it stuck with me, I'll say. Um, and that from personal experience, um, I had, um, we contract bailed um, one of our fields with the Turleys. And because our ground was rough, they broke their needles um, on their baler and um, not only did we not get our baling finished, uh, but we had to figure out who was responsible for you know the the baler not working properly and then breaking. And so I definitely I feel like 
I understand they look like tremendously powerful machines, but they're doing a finely tuned operation. Um, and so I definitely, I recognize that that's, it's more than it seemed at first glance. Mr. Chair, I would call yes. for the vote. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna add some more comments, but I'm ready to vote. Okay, I was gonna ask further comments. Do you yeah, want to my add? only comment is, you, if you brought up the question or your statement, since the record's closed, <laughs> right, it's not a question of uh, where the trash was coming from. Yeah. I can tell you my brother-in-law, who's now retired, managed the whole South Farms from Carlton South mm -hmm. and, or Yam Hill South for Burger Farms, which is a huge farming operation. Yes. And he said that most of they were seeing problems with litter mm -hmm. along both West Side Road, but primarily High Way 47, mm -hmm. that would interfere with their bailing and swapping. That, that, and once we cut back the amount, and Metro cut back the amount they came in, yeah. they still have a problem, but it's not nearly as bad. So, okay. so I think the cumulative impact is on farms that aren't right next to the. I think they're on farms in any place they call for you. So right, because the continued the continued operations essentially, according to the application, is the equivalent of expanded operations. Yeah. So I'm right. ready for the vote. Mary, okay. call for the vote. I'm ready for the vote. Okay. Do we have a motion on the floor? No. All right. Well, I move that we um, that we deny the Riverbend uh, remand, which is docket number SDR 16-14 slash FP slash 03, excuse me, dash 03, dash 14. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed same sign? Aye. Let the record show, this one always, I gotta think about it, okay? Right? Let the record show um, that Commissioners Olson and Kula voted to deny and Commissioner Starrett voted to not deny. We did it. Not deny, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, to approve. Okay, I can say that too. To approve. She denied to approve and deny. Uh, motion passes. All right, with that, I will. Uh, oh. will Thank you. We will hopefully have findings uh, by August 20th. Yes. Okay, with that, I will Thanks, close Bob. this hearing of this land use hearing. You guys making eyes at each other. Oh, Nancy and I. <laughs> I. I have it. My eye doesn't have it. Still doesn't have it. Won't have it. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's it. You got to have one more surgery. Commissioner Sarah's eyes have it. So. I, I. I. You say that maybe. I, I. I, I. I, I, sir. You know, you, you know everybody because of this whole thing where you were a reporter forever. And maybe you know people from other situations. You know anybody from yeah. here. Everybody. You remember I lived in Portland. That's right. Oh yeah, she she's one of those. They're not suburbanites. Transplant. Just, you're what? Yeah, but you're a crap. But you're transplant from a good place. Expat. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that I will move on to announcements, which is item I, and I'm totally spacing on if I have any announcements. I mean, I know. But know. you have, you met with Leah Horner, so I'd love yes. if you yes. have any follow up. Just, just a conversation where uh, mm -hmm. basically, and maybe just some some input from Pat Allen uh, regarding what's what we're expecting next week, which will be travel restrictions. Okay. Now, my understanding is is that checkpoints are unconstitutional in the state of Oregon, mm -hmm. which is why we don't do DUI stops. Um, it's funny that you looked at it. But, if, sad, but I, I just, DUI that's my understanding. Is that correct? Do, do you know that offhand? I don't know for sure, but I believe that's true. I have not addressed the issue for a number of years, so I can't recall that. So it's like voluntary. Do I don't know sure? off the top of my head. Okay. Are you sure talking about like, not, that's why we don't have them. Like, like randomized? Just checkpoints for DUI, yeah, but at this sure. point. Yeah. But yeah. that's for a crime that may not A checkpoint, a DUI checkpoint. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So really, I bring that up to say that, like in New York, they're doing checkpoints now. Oh, okay. uh, they're stopping people coming in and out of of New York and are um, uh, are doing uh, 
at checkpoints and mandatory quarantines and things like that. So I don't know that we'll we'll see that, but we do have a travel ban of some consequence coming, and that would be at this point they're talking about perhaps maybe next Tuesday okay. talking about it, uh, and that would be um, interstate travel, which is what we heard last week, and not intrastate travel. And uh, the other things that uh, I brought up, because we've heard from some private schools that uh, have would like to open, and um, when I asked about that and why they are not going to allow the schools, the private schools to open, I mean, because if you have daycare centers opening and if you have camps that are allowed to open and you have a variety of other, you can have 100 people in a church or whatever, you know, why is it that the, the private schools are being forced to stay closed? And Leah Horner, who is the governor's spokesperson, said, quote, because we don't want to see a mass exodus from the public schools. Now, that is perhaps a little more candid than she might have wanted to be, but I think that it's it's causing concern to the people who are opting to send their kids to private schools and would like a little more leeway when it comes to uh, government regulations. So mm -hmm. I'll add that. And also uh, right now, Pat Allen says that uh, they are going to begin messaging in terms of things will not be the same as before. And um, right now there are about 180,000 people on Oregon Health Plan, which is Medicaid because of the pandemic. So all of the CCOs are going to have more payments because they're not removing people from the Oregon Health Plan. Okay. And uh, right now, again, active conversations about the travel ban that will happen probably next week. And they're having some conversations with the other states that we border with, because you know, Governor Brown has uh, made a pact with Washington and California. And they say they don't want to keep people from working across state lines or shipping. And I don't think they can because of the Interstate Commerce Act. Um, but they don't expect an outright ban. But there will be guidance and restrictions in the coming days. That's all I have. Thank you. Did you, um, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on it now. I wanted to uh, follow up. Did, was there any, um, oh my gosh, it's totally gone. Well, like, Commissioner uh, Olson, you, it sounded like you had comments for it. Well, the travel ban is sure. really something interesting, especially if it comes out with any kind of quarantine restrictions. So if somebody wants to come into the state of Oregon, and this is the way Hawaii does it, mm -hmm. they want to come oh, to yeah. the state of Oregon, and if they're going to be here on vacation or for more than two weeks, they have to stay quarantined. Their servers have to stay quarantined for two weeks. Mm -hmm. But if you're only coming in for three or four or five days, you don't have to stay quarantined for that three or four or five days, but every day you have to check in. Somebody has to come out and take your temperature. Oh, wow. Somebody has to ask you all the questions and everything. My question was, well, if that's the case, how much is that going to cost the state by having somebody, all these people that are coming in the state for five, four or five days for a vacation to visit family, mm -hmm. how much is it going to cost the state to hire the people to make sure every one of those people are checked on a daily basis. Well, I know that we have a recruitment out for temporary workers who would be contact yeah. tracers uh, yeah. and uh, that the county does. So I know we're needing more capacity there. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's a good question. I know in New York, they are um, they are contacting people every day who are have come, f come in from out of state. And then state. if you're only coming in for two weeks, you have to stay quarantined for two weeks. So. Right. Well, thank you for that report. Yep. I appreciate it. And um, I'm on a call on tomorrow. Friday. Yes, that's tomorrow. They yes. talked about that they'll call. Okay. They'll have some. Is they'll have some more updates. And I think it's it's they're gonna. It sounds like maybe they'll talk about the travel restrictions, maybe in some more detail, or maybe just the same level. But then, a kind of general update on the, the, Is that the right state. Like nine thirty or ten o'clock. Nine thirty or ten o'clock in the morning or something like that. I think it's. I think it's at three o'clock. Three o'clock. I know I have one with OHA, and OHA call is 12 o'clock. But I know that the AOC call is is canceled or <clears throat> yeah, rescheduled. Yeah, 11 o'clock one. one. Okay. You're talking about the um, the AOC HHS retreat, which is from 9 to noon tomorrow. No, there was a... I have a so many there. calls. I don't know. I've got and then there's the, right. There may not be anything tomorrow. I don't know. I mean, this one, I don't know. And I might not know this one. Yeah. I don't know. 
legislative committee is Monday. Monday, yeah, legislative yes. committee is Monday. I have that. AOC on day. And I'm planning on calling, you know, calling into it just as an observer. And I don't want to have a transportation and economic development, I think, Tuesday. Okay. So, yeah. I will let you know if there's anything different from what Commissioner Stewart reported from the Wednesday. It's simply one for tomorrow for the. Okay, it's just with chairs. That's oh, why. just for yeah. that's why. It's, uh, it's a special chairs? subset. Chairs. It's for special any people. Chairs, like, any chair well, yours is for special to people, too. Any, any chair here should be. <laughs> I will probably be as intelligible as that chair. So. Will we expect a good report? Yes. Well, is it normally posted like all uh, ALC posted after the. Don't you know, know. What? I don't know. I think it's posted afterwards. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Well, so I will, I will report back. And we have our homework, which is the, um, the prioritizing this list. Yeah, so. I, I do would like to make one announcement. Yes. Like a, uh, it's more of a announcement than a comment that I've talked to several people over the last month mm -hmm. about uh, the sessions and not being able to come to the sessions. But there, you'd be surprised how many people, at least in McMinnville, mm -hmm. there are that faithfully watch the or watch yeah. our YouTube station. They faithfully watch every meeting on YouTube. And they said that that's one of the best things the county ever did is being like through FCM and everything. Yeah, that's one of the best things the county ever did is broadcasting. <laughs> I would hope that there are bigger, better things, but I acknowledge that in this moment that people have, I have, I have heard from folks who are watching too. It's I'd amazing. rather have them here. But. It's amazing what being stuck in your house will reduce you to having to watch on television. <laughs> I thought you were going to say they're saying it's one of the best things on TV, and I thought, you know what? That's pretty sad. <laughs> well, no, as some of us are professionals want, at this. It's not so. bad if you want to watch the 1962 World Series. Or... <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, any other announcements? Okay. Um, Ken. Actually, I, I just really briefly, and also knowing that we have uh, an executive session yes. immediately after this session. Yeah. Um, one thing I just wanted to quickly let you know and put on record that uh, um, some good news, um, some recognition, and this is really uh, a recognition of our finance team and budget team. Um, it's not something that we've done in the past, so this is new for, for uh, Yamhill County. Uh, as you know, every year uh, we, we go through an audit process and we prepare our annual financial report that we submit to the state. Uh, new for, it, it, this would have been last year, so the end of the fiscal year, the 2019 fiscal year, so the previous year, um, we submitted our, our, what we call our CAPR, our Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, to the Government, government Finance Association, Government Finance Officers Association. I'm just used to just always calling it GFOA. Right. Uh, we submitted our, our CAFR for review, and I just wanted to report back that uh, we were recognized and awarded a certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting. And that's really a, a reflection of the great work that our, all of our finance team, and that's not just the team in accounting. I mean, uh, Mike Armour is doing a fantastic job, and, and his staff does a fantastic job. But it's also the departments and and all the reporting and the record keeping and our updating of the finance system in, in preparation to, to make sure that we have one a transparent you know uh, financial reporting system and how we're processing. And, and so this is you know this is a, a big recognition of the fact that. We sent this to it, not only do we report this to the state, but we sent it to a third party. They went through a review process. We had to submit a lot. It's almost like doing a second audit. Um, and we've just received word that we, you know, we were being recognized for this. You know, I, I appreciate you bringing Thank that you. up, Ken, because one of the things that I've always felt is there's definitely, when you do a great job at things, and no doubt Mike's doing a great job of finance, Department heads are doing, I mean, you're doing a great job, everybody pulling it all together. But I've always said, when you get that kind of award or you get that kind of recognition, there isn't anything wrong with slapping yourself on the back. Because those kind of recognitions do more than any, like a lot of the land use decisions or anything we make to allow the people to 
so the citizens know that our finances are being managed very well. So. Yeah, and so part of that review, you know, of course it comes also with feedback and discussions and we're still going through the, the review because we're always looking to improve. And, uh, but again, you know, I just want to pass along some good news that, uh, Thank you. Yeah, Great. Congratulations Thank to the you. team Congratulations. for us. Thank you. Nice job, finance department. Thank you, Ken. Kristen, do you have anything? We take mm -hmm. a five minute break. Just want to make sure we report. Okay. Five minute break. We can adjourn and then. Right. Okay. Let's adjourn. With that, we'll adjourn this meeting. I'm the County Board of Commissioners, formal and formal session. Okay.